right, good evening. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for being here. I had a wedding rehearsal tonight. Just got here. Just got here. So I, I went to the wedding rehearsal, and, uh, and it's at this beautiful place in Vineland, and I'm there, and, and there's all these people like you. Like, there, I thought there was like a wedding tonight because everyone's in their like, wonderful gowns. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. And I can kind of see like where the, it's an outdoor wedding. It's going to be over there. There's a pavilion. And so I, uh, I go, well, let me just head inside and, and figure out where everybody is. And I walk in, you know, or as I'm walking in, there's this, uh, you know, girl with a, a beautiful white dress, just long flowing white dress. And I say, congratulations. And she said, thank you. So I'm like, this what a, it's a beautiful night. There are people are getting married. We're going to have a rehearsal for a great young couple that's getting married. I walk in to the building, and the person says, you're not here for the prom. <laughs> I'm like, uh, I'm sorry, what? And I said, wait, 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 wait. Are you saying that I'm old? That I'm too old to go to the prom? And she's like, um, yeah, yeah, I am. And I'm like, sorry, I'm here for a wedding rehearsal. Where is it? And where we start talking, we have a little bit of laugh. And eventually I find the wedding coordinator and we figure out how to get it done. But I realized that that girl wasn't the bride. It was just a girl going to the prom in a beautiful white dress. Um, and sure enough, Millville High School, right? We got some graduates from or, or at least folks that grew up in Millville. Anybody, anybody graduate from Millville High School? There you go, Carmen did. All right, good, thanks, buddy. So, yeah, that Millville High School is having their prom there tonight. So, But, yeah, did you ever feel like you just walk into a place and you don't belong? Or have people ever made you feel like, you know, this doesn't fit? And here's, I'm going to bring it all back to our Bible study tonight. As we talk about the New Testament tonight, see, watch what I do with this. Um, we're going to start to see how is it that we got what we call the New Testament, our scripture. Last week, we talked about the Old Testament. Tonight, we're going to do a hop, skip, and a jump through the New Testament. And we'll talk, again, a little bit more in detail next week about what we call the, how we got or how we interpret scripture, how we look at what scripture is. But as uh, the story unfolds. We have these books, these stories, these, uh, these letters that are going to these churches all throughout the region, and we are calling those things, right, we call them now scripture. And throughout, you know, the first couple centuries as part of the canonicity process, there are some books that they said, you don't fit here. You're a little too old. See what I did there? made a connection. So a couple things when we start to look at how we got our New Testament. They call it an uh, apostolicity. That's one of the criteria for canonicity is apostolicity, which is, is this from the disciples? Is this from the eyewitnesses? Is this from the people that got to see firsthand what Jesus did? The other would uh, certainly be called Catholic, 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 my speech impediments getting in the way. Catholic, Catholicity. <laughs> we can't edit this out either because it's live. A Catholicness, <laughs> which means a universality, universality to does this fit? Does this fit through the broad spectrum? Are multiple churches? viewing this letter or this story, this gospel, as being an authentic eyewitness. So a universality of uh, the scripture. And again, if I walked in in my you know, cut-off jeans and my T-shirt, that person would have certainly said, you are not here for the prom. See, I kind of thought, like, I, I, you know, I'm looking all right. I got my sport jacket on. I, I've got, I'm looking okay. But you should have seen these kids. They're like tuxedoed out. The dresses were like crazy. The hair was really poofy. There was a couple that rolled in on a horse-drawn carriage. And I was like, man, these folks are doing it up. Okay, so we're going to jump into the New Testament. Thanks for joining us.
Um, let's bow forward a prayer as we start to uh, look at Scripture. In all things, Lord, we ask that you would uh, help us understand your word. Uh, we want it to be a lamp to our feet, a light unto our path. So guide us tonight in our conversation and as we look to see you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so have you thought about some questions, maybe about the New Testament? All right, that's what I want you to think about. Uh, hopefully, as I talk about a couple things, I might answer some of your questions, maybe that you've been pondering about the New Testament. Uh, but I want you to think about, we will have a time at the end to talk through some questions. Okay, so here's the thing. Jesus shows up, and that changes the world. This is the beginning of the New Testament. John would say that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and Word was with God. He was with God at the beginning. Okay, so uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what we see as the Gospels. And if you have your packet, again, live streamers, you can email our office, and we will scan that and send that to you. Uh, if you have the packet, hopefully you see some of the documents, well, a little bit of geography, but you see some of the connections of how how we see the structure of the Old Testament, how it kind of connects to some of the structure of the New Testament, how the Gospels are like this in the Old Testament and how the letters or the epistles would be like this. All right, so there's just a couple resources we're going to talk about. I'm not going to talk too much about geography, but it's one of those things to where if you're wondering, like when we talk about the book of Revelation and about the seven churches, there's a map that shows the seven churches of the book of Revelation there in your packet. So um, Jesus shows up and the world is changed. Now what happens is we see after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John comes the Acts of the Apostles. Because Jesus says, gives this promise after his resurrection, he ascends back to the Father and he gives them a commission and at the end of Matthew's gospel, we call it the Great Commission to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that he has commanded them, right? So here's what we do. We go, uh, make disciples of all nations. Well, what do we do? We teach and we baptize. Um, and then Jesus has this beautiful promise, and he says, and lo, I am with you to the end of the age. And then he's like, peace. Peace. <laughs> and he ascends back to the Father. Uh, but before doing that, he says, I have a gift for you. I have uh, something that will, the Father will send in my name, the promise of the Holy Spirit. Again, here he is in the book of Acts where he's gathered his disciples and he says, you need to wait for this gift, wait for the Holy Spirit, and you will be my witnesses. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Peace, he ascends, right, uh, to the Father. And they wait, the church the community, the people of God, wait for the gift and the promise that Jesus talked about. And so in Acts chapter 2, you see the Spirit descend and uh, fill and empower the disciples to be able to deliver a message for all of those that were gathered there, multiple nations represented in the city of Jerusalem at that time on what we call the day of Pentecost, or what we call the birthday of the church. Now throughout the rest of that uh, book, the, the, what we call the book of Acts, or the Acts of the Apostles, is you see the guy named Paul come onto the scene and his missionary journeys and the disciples going and, and you start to, you know, see where Paul is starting to land and some of the experiences that he's doing. So that's kind of like some of the history, you know, in the way that we had the historical books in the Old Testament, this Acts of the Apostles is a little bit like a history connected into you know, when we get these letters from uh, the Apostle Paul to these churches, you know, in Corinth and Thessalonica and Ephesus and Philippi and the churches in Galatia, and it's, as it starts to go on and on, I think 21 out of the 27 books of the New Testament are letters. We'll talk a little bit more in detail about what we call these letters. But you start to see that that's like the rest of the, the, the scripture of the New Testament. And so up until the very last book, which is an apocalyptic book, which we call the book of Revelation, okay? Uh, and if you've ever tried to tackle that thing, okay, you notice it's a ham sandwich. It's pretty, it's pretty, pretty unique. Again, we'll, we won't talk too much about it tonight, but a lot of people really start to get sidetracked whenever they engage in the book of Revelation 
Because there's always something about us. We talked a little bit about this last week. There's always something about us to where we want to figure out what's the secret code. I know it says it right there on the page, but there's got to be something behind it. Remember, the fundamentals of any Bible study is going to be observation, interpretation, and application. And what we want to jump to is interpretation right away. Right away. Well, what does this mean? We read it. What does it mean? Where reality, we have to spend some time looking at what it says. Because if you don't understand what it's saying, then you will probably not interpret it to get the actual meaning. I remember sitting in a Bible study with great teachers and wonderful people. And, you know, even as a young adult, this is many years ago, where they were going through the book of Revelation, they were talking about all these signs and these symbols and the animals and the horns and the trumpets and the seals and all of this just like weird, almost science fiction type literature. And the teacher was so sure he'd read a verse and say, that's Russia. And they read another verse and he says, that's China. And I'm, and I'm like, I'm looking at my Bible, and I'm like, what? Where do you get that from? But he started to, have you ever heard of this idea called numerology? What they'll do is they'll say, well, it says in this chapter and verse here, and it connects to this chapter and verse there, and you factor in, you add this and that, and you carry the two, and you divide it by pi, and what you find is it gets this number in this verse, it says this, which means this, and we interpret it to do this, which means we should act in this way. And I'm like, what in the world are you talking about, man? By the way, Scripture wasn't written with chapters and verses. Mr. and Miss Numerology. It wasn't like Paul was like, chapter 1, verse 1, and start writing, you know? That's what we put in. That's what we put in to help people, you know, put handles on things. But it's been probably one of the most deterring things we could have done in Scripture. Because what we do is we'll hit our chapter, and then we'll be like, good. Right? And you're like, oh man, there's some things within the English translation that I wish, that I wish they wouldn't have broke the chapter there. That, oh man, if you could have just carried it maybe another verse or two. I think these first two verses actually fit better with the previous chapter. But sometimes we get to the end of the chapter and that's the end of the Bible study, that's the end of the story. One of the things where, where I like this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And uh, the Apostle Paul goes and he, he does the whole chapter. And then he ends the chapter with a cliffhanger, which is great. Right? Which is, and I will show you a still more excellent way. That's good. That's like when the show ends on whatever show you're binging on whatever streaming device you're using when it says next episode, you know, in 15 seconds, you're like, oh, I'm definitely watching the next one. It's a cliffhanger because we're like, well, what is that most excellent way? But if we, right, yeah, it kind of invites us into the next chapter and into the next verse. If I speak with the tongues of angels but have not love, I'm like a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. 1 Corinthians 13, which we call the love chapter. That's the still more excellent way. That's the way that Paul says, I want to show it to you. But if you stop at the end of 12, you may be like, what is this way? You got to read the next verse. Read the, you know. Uh, I remember talking with uh, a youth Bible study a couple weeks ago where we talked about the part where it says, wives, submit to your husbands. Right? And I'm like, have you ever just like, heard that verse thrown out there? And the person didn't talk about the other verses around it. Because it's important to understand that there's a verse before and after that that starts to give context and ideas on what it means for wives to submit to their husbands. Oh, by the way, husbands have a command as well. And children have a command, and parents have a command in the midst of that scripture. But if you only take one out of context, right, you can certainly take it out of context. But so we have all of, you know, these different ideas. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you'll see in your packet, I mean, 
One of the things we're kind of talking about when we approach Scripture in general is to approach it with an openness and a little bit of fluidity to it. To say, how can I approach this text? Because I believe that this is a life-transforming text. Okay, I read about the story of Jesus, and Jesus has changed my life. And the reason I understand Jesus is because I can read it in the Word. Okay, But we have to understand what the Word presents to us. Yes, it presents to us Jesus. But did you understand when you look at the story of Jesus, there are Gospels, there's four of them, that tell his story. And you know what? They're different, but they're also the same. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, I've said before, are what we call the synoptic Gospels, which means they see similarly, the optic, or they see in the same manner. They are concerned about presenting Jesus and his public ministry related to the announcing of the kingdom of God. I mean, that's a pretty basic thesis statement. Here's Jesus, here's what he taught, here's his life, his death, and his resurrection. Now, you see in your packet how Matthew and Mark and Luke kind of share some stories together. There's other things that they have that is unique to their own story. Um, if you notice, they might begin in a little bit of different way. Matthew 1.1 is going to talk about Jesus being the son of Abraham and the son of David, which has a lot of real sort of Jewish big-time home run hitters right in that first verse, right? Because Matthew, we can start to see throughout his story, is approaching it from a very Jewish lens. Of course, Jesus was, right, a first-century Jewish person. Okay, sometimes I think we forget that. We shouldn't forget that, by the way, right? But when he is the son of David and the son of Abraham, it's really, really important. Mark, he isn't necessarily going to be writing for his uh, Jewish audience. Mark, which is more of a Gentile name, by the way, is going to be writing more towards a Gentile audience, which means a non-Jewish audience. So when he's going to talk about, and Jesus fulfills this prophecy, and, and Jesus uh, did this, which fulfills this in the Old Testament, Matthew connects that. Mark, is, he's like, I don't care about that stuff as much. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, but let's just tell the story of Jesus. In fact, Mark says, let's get it out of the way. Verse 1, Mark 1, 1, Jesus, the Son of God. There he is. Luke is going to say, there's a reason why I'm writing this. And I love that part of the beginning of Luke. Uh, writes it uh, kind of in honor of a person that we think are is called Theophilus, my dear Theophilus. And he says, I've tried to sit down to write an orderly account of, of this story, okay? And now actually, Theophilus means God lover. Theos, God. And you know, phileo means to love. The city of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. That's where they get the word, okay? So, from the Greek word, to love. Brotherly love, that is. There's other words for love in the Greek language we'll talk about later. But when John shows up, as you know, the interesting thing about the sharing of sources, how a lot of scholars think that they would have leaned on each other, told similar stories, but there's also what they call Q, um, which, which is as you kind of study basic New Testament scholarship, that there was this other source that they're not so sure, right, is named, so they just kind of called it Q. Not like QAnon, right? Don't, we're not getting into the QAnon stuff tonight. You know what I mean? Because I'm not down with the QAnon stuff. All right. But that's what it's called. And so basically, they were saying there's some other source that they're drawing all of this from. So when you look, and again, we'll talk about this from the actual text itself, in basic New Testament scholarship, is there is a general consensus that as these people wrote the story of Jesus, we see their humanity in their storytelling. We see the purpose for their writing, because they tell us why they're writing it. Uh, and we see probably the audience of whom they are trying to tell the story to. John begins his story of Jesus. Sometimes they call John's gospel the spiritual gospel. John's gospel was written really towards the later end of his life, later than the other gospels. In fact, when you think about the chronology of the writings of the New Testament, it's not like the first book written was Matthew. 
right? It's not like, oh, uh, first book, Matthew, and then who else is going to write one? Mark's like, I'll write one. Okay. It doesn't work that way. Because remember the story that they tell in the Gospels. Remember the ascension, the commission, Pentecost, and what happens? The disciples go, and they call this the period of kerygma, which means preaching. Which means the disciples go to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And the Apostle Paul particularly takes on the commission to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Because he would go to a town. Right? After meeting Jesus along the Damascus Road, you can read that story in the book of Acts, he now takes on a new calling. This guy Saul, who we know as Paul, was a very legalistic Pharisee who was zealous to uh, stamp out this new movement called the Way until Jesus met him and called him to now be a witness and an apostle to the Gentiles. Because he'd go to the town and all you needed in those days for a synagogue would be 10 Jewish men. That's what it meant to have a synagogue. If you had 10 Jewish men, that's a synagogue, okay? And they'd have a synagogue. So when uh, the Apostle Paul, you can read about in the book of Acts, goes to the city of Philippi, and he says there's no synagogue there, in this big city, in this big cosmopolitan city, there wasn't even 10 people there. So he decides to go out to, like, the city gates. He's like, he's just hanging out, and he's like, Hey, uh, anybody want to talk about God? <laughs> and there was this woman named Lydia there. It was like, uh, yeah, let's talk. And then they met another woman who had a challenging background and went through some challenging experience. She was actually enslaved. And they met her. She was uh, set free. And then they are thrown in jail because, you know, having that girl thrown in jail wasn't good for the owners of that girl and they made life difficult for Paul and they threw Paul in jail until God set him free from the Philippian jail and the Philippian jailer then becomes the next person in the church of Philippi. But Paul would go into a town, he'd go to the synagogue, he would begin to proclaim that Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed one, the one that was written or foretold, the one that was waiting and expecting Ding, you know, they were looking for, and they'd say, some would say, oh, that's really interesting, Paul. You're helping us understand these connections from our scripture of how he is the son of David and uh, going to be a king and all this other light to the nation stuff. But also there were some people that were like, um, get out. We don't believe you. You can, you can go. So what Paul would do then is he'd go to the synagogue first always, and most times he'd get kicked out. And then that's how he started to take up this, you know, he's seeing the Holy Spirit. Again, think about from Acts chapter 2 from the very beginning, the Holy Spirit being poured out on all people. So when he runs into different Gentiles, right, non-Jewish people that want to learn about Jesus being the Messiah, being the anointed one, being the king, being the savior, being the Christ, the, he's seeing God is doing something new. God is expanding and opening up new ideas for this thing, right, what we call the kingdom of God. So then, right, as Paul would leave, okay, because he wouldn't stay there forever, he would leave, but then these gatherings of people, because that's what the word church means. It means a group that is gathered. It actually means those who are called out, the ecclesia, those who are called out. Apostle means one who is sent. So he would be going to the next town, and sometimes this community would send Paul a message, messengers, and Paul would write letters back to these churches to encourage them and to help them, either based upon some questions or situations that they were dealing with. And again, if you think about uh, what we call the letter of uh, 1 and 2 Corinthians, if you think that like the church today has a lot of drama going on, you haven't read the letter of 1 Corinthians. Man, they, it's like a Jerry Springer show. Does anybody remember the Jerry Springer show? They had all sorts of wild stuff going on in that church. Woo! Crazy. So you can tell that Paul is addressing certain issues that were happening that he had been told about. So he's, he's writing these things. Um, so whenever we read the majority of our New Testament, which is going to be letters, okay, we got to wrestle with, we're reading other people's mail. We're reading other people's mail. 
So I want you to think about, you know, I've got uh, three kids, okay? I know you may have children. Did you ever notice that the children are not all the same? Parents, can you be like, yeah, you know, they're all like my kids, but they're just different, okay? Um, it would be as if, like, two different children uh, would write to their father and say, Father, I need some fatherly advice. Now, you can imagine, some of you might have a kid that's, like, very diligent in their studies, and they're very driven, and, and they're you know, almost workaholic sometimes. They just want to get that promotion, and they want to do the next thing, and they're just very serious about everything. Did you ever notice that if you have a very serious kid who's a hard worker and, and very diligent in all these things, that maybe you have another kid that's just like, whatever, man. You know, like, hey, let's just go to a concert, you know, very artistic and creative, and they're drawing, and they're singing, and you're like, what in the world? This one wants to be a doctor, and this one wants to be a dancer. What's happening here? So, uh, if both children say, Father, I need some advice about the next step of my life, and the father wrote a letter to these children, the same father would write almost contradictory letters, because to the diligent, driven child, the father might say, child, you might need to stop and smell the roses. You know, you're working so hard. Take a moment to enjoy life, to stop and to smell the roses. And then you read the other letter that says, stop smelling the roses and get a job. <laughs> Okay, same father, but just, so this is what we kind of think about and wrestle with when we look at some of the majority of our New Testament, which is going to be the letters. And I'll talk more about the Gospels if you want, but I want to dive into some actual scripture. I know I've been like jabbering on. Let, let's have some fun uh, looking. So when I talk about a lot of the epistles, I'll use Paul, okay, because I traditionally uh, attribute the majority of the letters to Paul, though not all scholars would. It's just easier for me as a pastor to say, Paul wrote it. <laughs> you know? But part of the fluidity and, uh, fluidity and the openness of when we approach the New Testament is we must be willing to say that, you know, when we look at the text itself, Paul may not have written everything that we say Paul has written. And you know what? That's okay. It's okay. Sometimes, though, we can approach Scripture very rigid. But I wanted to share with you a couple of Scriptures to say it's okay to have an openness when we look at this book because this book invites us to think differently. Okay, so let's look at, uh, Ray, we should have some of these Scriptures. Uh, Galatians 4, 15. It says, where then is your blessing of me now? This is what I say the Apostle Paul. Right? I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. So a lot of scholars think that during a certain period of Paul's age, he would have had trouble with his eyesight. Does anybody wear glasses here today? Yeah, a couple of us. Okay, throughout, uh, right, throughout our lives, maybe you didn't grow up with glasses, but maybe later in life, I know a lot of people that when they go on for their PhDs, if they never wore glasses, they do so much reading, they're wearing glasses by the end of it. Or you say, I never had glasses as a kid, but when I turned 40 years old, I, I couldn't see anything anymore. You know what I'm talking about? Or there was a gentleman in uh, my congregation who, I never heard this term before, but he had what he called macular degeneration. I'm not a doctor, I don't understand that. But what a lot of scholars think is that they think maybe Paul had that. Uh, something that just affected his eyesight. That's why when he's writing, uh, you'll see this. Let's look at the next verse. Galatians 5.11. See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Was there something in the letter or in the scroll that maybe a scribe or a friend of Paul's or a disciple of Paul's would have listened to his dictation uh, but then there would have been a moment where Paul would have said, I sign this in my own hand. Uh, I always say the Apostle Paul wrote the book of, or the letter to the church in Rome, the Romans. But in Romans 16, chapter 22, it says this, I, Tertius, who wrote down this letter, greet you in the Lord. So, <laughs> some of it might be, you know, I say that 
you know, we say, tradition would say, Paul wrote the letter to the Romans. And then the book of Romans says that Tertius wrote it. What did this mean? Okay, so this might mean that Paul would have said, Here, here's what I want to say to this church. Can you write this down for me? I can't see as well as I used to. And a person would help write some of this down. Or in um, uh, 2 Thessalonians, I think we have that scripture too, Ray, uh, 3.17, I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand, which is the distinguishing mark in all my letters. This is how I write. Who knows that? So it's an interesting thing. That's, I just say, share these things to say, we, we, in this text, are given an openness and options to see how do we approach these things. If we're going to be rigid and be like, it's Paul and only Paul, the scripture itself doesn't, doesn't encourage us with this. In fact, when we talk about how we got the letters that we did, one of the things we see is there's a section of Paul's letter, Ephesians, Colossians, 2 Thessalonians, and 1 and 2 Timothy, and Titus. Okay, so uh, several what they call Deuteropauline or disputed letters, which is these were letters potentially that would have been written after Paul had died. Paul was beheaded. But these letters begin to circulate after his death. So one of the things that they wrestled with and understanding when they brought these New Testament letters into our New Testament is wrestling with the difference that they see in these letters compared to some of the other letters that would have been more authentically viewed as Paul's writings. There's a difference in theology, which is very important to name, that they present some different ideas than what Paul would have consistently shared in some of his other letters related to theology. So even in the New Testament, we see differences in theology. We see differences in vocabulary and differences in style. I mean, you read, um, you know, some of you probably read some of the devotions that I write. You probably notice I have a general style of how I write. After many, many more years of reading my devotionals, you're going to start to pick up my general thing, right? Uh, there are certain words like my daughter, one of my daughters, the day she was born, I don't know if it was when my, I think it was when they handed her to my wife. She, one of the first things my wife said about our daughter was, this is the lady. And all of a sudden, that was just, we called her lady ever since. She's just the lady. So if you hear me yelling at my children as they're running around the church, which they do every Sunday, and I will yell at them for running around the church, uh, you may hear me say, lady. I'm just not like yelling at, you know, a per, you know, female person of our congregation. I'm yelling at my daughter <laughs> because that's her, that's her nickname. That's her special name. Now, if I started, you know, writing emails or letters home or just referring to her as another word, right, you would start to pick up pretty quickly. My family would pick up. Who's he talking about? I was like, oh, I just start calling her a, a different word consistently. Like, oh, princess and princess and princess. And... No, 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 no. Who's that? There's some of that within the language of these letters that says Paul normally doesn't use these words. These are a little bit different vocabulary words. So at the end, they wrestled with some of these letters, but some of it is important, okay? Because in some of these letters, we start to see a difference of theology, of, of some concepts in the New Testament that we wrestle with. For instance, as much as we talked last week about the Old Testament being like, the mean God, and I like the New Testament better because you got Jesus, of course. And yes, we all love Jesus, right? We're Christians. But there's things in the New Testament that we must wrestle with as well. For instance, the Apostle Paul seemingly promoting slavery. We're reading other people's mail. So we, when we look back to the letter right, in Titus or in Timothy or in whatever, right, we start to see 
what Paul is advising a church from about 2,000 years ago. And as much as we like to think that, like, things aren't different, they kind of are. I mean, can you think about just even within our own country, the differences we've seen in our country since 1950? I remember I was talking to a congregation member, and they're like, oh, I wish we could just go back to the good old days. We, we don't say that, though, do we? <laughs> I want to go back to the good old days when this church was, you know, and everybody wore a hat, you know, and everyone wore a suit to church, and those were the good old days. You know, they're probably referring the period of time in the 1950s when men dressed a certain way to church, women dressed a certain way to church, and culturally it was, that's where everybody was on Sunday morning. In fact, in the town that we were in where I was pastoring, they had laws during that time that said no stores are open on Sunday morning. They called them blue laws. Do you remember those things? And so... Uh, so, yeah, what else was there to do? There's nothing else to do. You weren't allowed on the beach. It was a short town, by the way. You weren't allowed on the beach until noon on a Sunday. So I said, oh, those were great, and everybody was at church. Nobody wanting to go to the beach instead of coming to church. I said, yeah, I, understand. I totally understand. I mean, I wasn't around then. I wasn't born uh, in the 50s. I don't understand the good old days like you talked about. But maybe the good old days weren't as good for everybody. Well, what do you mean? He said, well, uh, see that guy over there? His name was Dick Grimes. There's a baseball field named after him in that town. African-American man, served in World War II. Served his community all of his life. And for the majority of his life was told he had to go to a different beach because he's black. It's separate watering uh, fountains that he had to drink at, different bathrooms, different schools. That was like, right? Remember those days? Some of us might remember those days. And so, when we look back, we see how the world changes and how people change with the world. And some of those things are actually good now. So what we do is when we see Paul writing what would be sort of advocating pro-slavery, we do the cultural context work and wrestle with to say, that's someone else's mail for another time of which we don't advocate for anymore. Unless you want to be like, yay, slavery tonight. Then we'll talk after the Bible study about some things you need to, <laughs> you need some help in. Anybody like pro-slavery here today? Okay. All right, good. We got that wrestle with. The role of women. The role of women, Paul talks about, that we wrestle with. And there are still some congregations that a seventh grade boy would carry more authority than the woman that would be teaching his seventh grade Sunday school class. There's some churches that once you get into seventh grade, you can't have a female teacher anymore. Because women are supposed to, you've heard this phrase before, keep silent. You down with that? I mean, I'm not. And there's biblical reasons for why. I think people could also show also biblical reasons why they would say, how women should keep silent in church. I'm like, well, you also don't make them cover their heads. We're reading other people's mail. So, one of the things we've seen is as culture has changed, I mean, even within the people called Methodists, if we take our community for an example related to how we've seen this change within the world, John Wesley wrote a powerful text called Thoughts on slavery, where at the beginning of his life, based upon his understanding and the interpretation of the Bible, he, remember, think about you know, 319 years ago, that was like part of the culture. And he was like, oh, well, of course, the Bible says it's fine. And then he has a change in his life. And he begins to, to see that this is not the way of Jesus. This is not you know, Christ-like. This is not who we are called to be as believers. 
And so he wrote this powerful text called Thoughts on Slavery. There was a a person in England by the name of William Wilberforce who was also a powerful advocate along with the early Methodists to eradicate slavery in the United Kingdom, in Britain. You can read er, about his life. You can watch a movie about his life. This movie is called Amazing Grace. Anybody see that movie? William Wilberforce and the Methodists powerfully connected. And by the way... The movie's called Amazing Grace is because one of the people that impacted William Wilberforce was a guy by the name of John Newton, who used to own slaves. He met Jesus, and then he became absolutely transformed and was fighting for the abolition of slavery in England. And you probably know him best because he wrote the hymn, Amazing Grace. So the next time we sing that hymn in church, which we probably all know and could sing at least the first couple phrases of the first verse by memory, the guy who wrote that used to be a slave owner until he met Jesus and changed his mind. We see it within the history of our country, how people used the Bible to continue to oppress people. We see the split between the north and the south. Come on, I don't have to belabor this, right? You get this stuff? But you could see in Scripture what would be, and that's why a lot of people wrestle with, I can't get down with the Bible. I can't get down with the Christianity stuff because there's verses in there that say it's okay to own slaves. Now, thinking Christians, which I hope we can be, can figure out how to engage with people in this way. To say, maybe it doesn't mean exactly that. Or maybe we're reading someone else's mail. But if we view it as if God dictated these words and said, Paul, write this down. And we lose the humanity of Paul, the humanity of his scribes that tell us that they are writing these letters and calling out the messengers and calling out the people in the text itself. There's a section in 1 Corinthians where Paul is like, this is my opinion So, obviously, I'm against a direct dictation model of the inspiration of Scripture. Because Scripture tells us clearly that Paul says, this is my opinion. Is it like God is like, okay, Paul, I'm going to let you share your opinion now. Go ahead and write it down. You see Paul wrestling with, this is what I think around this issue. But I'm going to defer to the Lord Jesus' comments when he said this. He was lifting up the authority of Jesus while also saying, when I give you my advice on this... You need to know that it's my advice. I mean, Scripture is a fascinating thing. Let's dive a little bit more in detail into one letter. Are you with me so far? I'm not putting you to sleep, am I? Okay, Galatians, if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to the book of Galatians. The Scripture will also be on the screen as well. Uh, Do we have Galatians verses 1 through 2? Yes, it's on the screen as well. So let's just look at this. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. (laughs) You know, I mean, like, and God. You know, Jesus sent me, and you know what? So did God. I'm not sent by any man. I'm getting my marching orders from God and Jesus, okay? This is the only letter, by the way, that Paul so bluntly says this. So whenever we see something like that, something must be going on that he wants to affirm even more. I am sent because of Jesus Christ, God the Father who raised him from the dead. Let's keep going. And he's going to write now, and all the brothers and sisters with me, look at this phrase, to the churches in Galatia. So there is a understanding that as Paul is writing this, he's writing this to more than just one community. That this was something that was meant to be circulated, okay? Now here's what happens in this letter to uh, the people in the region or to the churches of Galatia. Remember Paul would go to the synagogue and he'd you know, get kicked out or whatever and he'd start his own you know, movement, right? Called Followers of the Way. They eventually call them Christians. Well, what would happen is that Paul wasn't the only Pharisee that believed and wanted to follow Jesus. There were other Pharisees like Paul who right, believed and started to live and follow Jesus 
But one of the things they started to do was they started to, like, they couldn't let go of, of their background or this Hebrew scripture. Because remember, when they're going out to these churches, Jesus didn't show up and be like, let me write this all down for you. Did you ever notice that? Jesus is preaching. He's proclaiming the kingdom of God. He's never like, write this down, fellas. Let me write this down. Oh, hold on. I'm receiving a message that I want to communicate on papyrus to you right now. The early church began with the preaching, the kerygma, the community, the witness of the disciples, of the apostles, of the 12 that went out to be in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth of the Apostle Paul to now take this witness of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ to the people. And I'm going to say something, I think, which is a little controversial, but I don't know if the Apostle Paul viewed his own letters as the way we view them as being Scripture. When Paul talks about Scripture... 2 Timothy 3.16, that all scripture is God-breathed. What scripture is he talking about? For Paul, I don't know if he would have thought this letter that I'm writing to Galatia. I think he viewed it, right? What we see in the early church, Clement of Alexandria, first century church fathers, looking back on what is starting to be formed in, they actually will quote what would be a portion of Matthew. Or they would quote one of Paul's letters as it's being circulated to all the churches in that region. They're starting to see that when they called it scripture, the way we view scripture, right, they would see it as uh, a writing, Paul's writing. And it does carry a level of Inspiration. Clement of Alexandria said that Paul was writing uh, in the Spirit. Okay? Um, but the way the early Christians viewed this thing that, that we have the Bible is really very differently than, I think, how we do it. And, and there's, nothing, you know, there's nothing wrong with how we do it. If we, unfortunately, though, don't observe it well, we will not interpret it well. And if we can't get the right interpretation, then our application could be harmful to each other. Do you see how that's being unfolds throughout history of how it says it here, and I'm going to interpret it this way, and I'm going to apply it this way, and we see this different thing. So it's the same way in the church of uh, Galatia, in the churches of Galatia. These people were called Judaizers, which is they would actually come after Paul, they would show up to this church and they'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah, Paul talked to you about this stuff. But then they would start to lean into to say, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You remember Paul's a Pharisee too. Did he not tell you about this? Did he not uh, fill you in on what it actually means to be a follower of Jesus? Uh, we think he did. Well, what do you say? Oh, you got to be circumcised. Uh, excuse me? you got to be circumcised. All you Gentiles, circumcision. Why? you got to be Jewish first, and then you be Christian. That's why they called them Judaizers. So you'll see throughout the letter to the churches in Galatia, Paul talks a lot about this. Because what, here's what happens. He says in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, can you sense some of his frustration? At, you know, he does all this work, and he wants to go on to the next town and continue to do the good work of God, and he got people following him that are just messing it all up. You could see his frustration. Let's check it out. Verse 6, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and a turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. 
As we've already said, so I now say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Man, he's like trying to drive this home. This is the situation that's happening. And he, you know, in the next chapter, in Galatians 2, 2 verses 15 through 16, he says, we who are Jews by birth, you know, and he's even leaning into, you know, all oh, those sinful Gentiles, <laughs> you know. We know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. He's going to address again in chapter 4 legalism. He's going to say in Galatians chapter 5 that Look, if you want, I mean, he's going to say some really kind of like wild stuff in Galatians 5. I'm not going to say it publicly, but you can read it. It's in your Bible. Uh, he's going to talk about this. That Look, Christ is of no benefit to you. If you go ahead and do the circumcision thing, he's presenting in the letter to the churches of Galatia the reminder of the radical grace of God to counterbalance the uh, Judaizers, particularly the legalists who want the law. Now, here's what's happening. Also, you'd think, oh, yeah, man, grace of God, I can do whatever I want. Forget those legalists. Paul says, easy, careful. He goes on to talk about in Galatians 5, that yes, we are called to freedom. And he unpacks it some more with, we are then not called to just live with a liberty that has no consequences to our actions. He's going to talk a little bit more about the, uh, the works of the flesh compared to what would be called the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. So, there were a group of people called the antinomians. Nomos means law. So, you either had people that, after hearing the message of the grace of Jesus Christ, falling into different camps or ideas about how to live this gospel in their lives. You've had some people that would uh, follow the track of the Judaizers that was like, yeah, we got to like hold the law and legalism's important. We got to obey all the things. And even though, you know, the grace of Jesus Christ helps us with freedom from that law, there's something, there's just part of us that drifts more towards a legalistic understanding of things. We know where we stand. We know if we're in good standing of these things, but we also know who's not in good standing of these things. And Paul in his letters, not to, just to Galatia, but uh, throughout his letters, is going to talk about this idea of what legalism can do. But he's mindful to what is called the libertines, or what we've taken now into that word to be called liberals. Oh my goodness, is that a, I hope I didn't say a curse word. Right? Do you see this in today's world? That someone is a conservative. And the worst parts of conservatives is it leads towards legalism. And then you got a liberal, all those liberals. And the worst part of the freedom or the libertine spirit of the liberal is that it's just a no-holds-barred, whatever works, it's fine with us. And the Apostle Paul in the letter to the churches of Galatia shows us the right way, the middle way to live, that we don't drift into one side or the other, but we hold the tension. Remember, we're talking about building bridges on Sunday mornings between two different sides of things, about a legalistic understanding and also a, uh, a liberal understanding. And at the end of the day, as it's said in the classic uh, rock song, I've got clowns on the left of me and jokers to the right. Here I am. Stuck in the middle with you. Anybody know that song, Mike? You know, you know that song. You know that song. All right. So um, 
One of the things we see is when we look at the New Testament and we struggle with, you know, challenging passages of the New Testament, we see if we let Scripture speak for itself, something that opens us up into just new understandings and new ways of looking at these things. One of my favorite stories is Acts chapter 15 uh, about the Jerusalem Council, where the church changed its mind about something. What an idea. And what we see is that as the Holy Spirit is being poured out, as the disciples are going out, what we see is, right, if we want to understand the timeless truth of Scripture, we must also be willing to name that it was truth in its time. There is timeless truth in Scripture, but there's also truth in its time. And that's what we do when we approach the Word of God for the people of God very seriously. That's what we do when we study the Bible. There's a ton more about the New Testament I'd love to share with you, but I'm going to wrap it up and take some questions. What do you got? This Paul guy. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, yeah. So you, you see the, uh, the fallible nature of the writers when, or as, you know, when Peter and Paul were getting into it a little bit. These are titans of the faith that were disagreeing at some point and figuring out how to work that out. But yeah, Paul and Barnabas had a little bit of a falling out over, I believe it was John Mark, because something happened where like, they needed John Mark, and John Mark didn't come through when they needed him. And so they were getting ready to leave on their next journey. And, and Barnabas is like, let's bring John Mark. And Paul's like, I'm not bringing that guy. He wasn't there when I needed him. He's like, I, I'm not bringing him. And Barnabas, being the son of encouragement, is like, come on, give him a second chance. And Paul's like, no. <laughs> now, you see Silas then come into the scene uh, Paul and Silas and Barnabas and John Mark, and they kind of go do their own things. But you also see, I think it's in 1 Timothy. I'd have to double check some of the references. There are some references where you start to see Paul talk about John Mark again in favorable terms. That it seems like they have a little bit of a connection again and or a reunion. Um, but those verses aren't coming to the top of my head. But there is a little bit of what most scholars think a happy ending over that falling out. But, yeah, you, you see that time and time again. Did that answer your question? That's right. That's right. The gospel still went forth. Right. Absolutely. Any other questions? Any other thoughts? You're ready, you're ready for ice cream, aren't you? You want to go home and have some ice cream. Okay, so here's what we'll do. I'm happy to stay and chat. Next week, we're going to talk about uh, a little bit of the canonicity of Scripture, a little bit about the authority of Scripture, of how we view it, of when we talk about Scripture, like what is it that we mean when we say this is the word of God for the people of God, thanks be to God, right? What is this book that we call the B-E-I-B-L-E? Yes, that's a book for me. I stand alone on the word of God. 
the B-I-B-L-E. We're going to talk a little bit more in detail about that. Hopefully, that will be a, a good, good time. Uh, then, in weeks four, five, and six, we're going to start to tackle what many refer to as the tough questions related to Scripture. How do we engage with Scripture and science? How do we engage with Scripture and the troubling passages in the Bible that we see? So like violence, when God's like, go kill everybody. And we're like, huh? What? So we're going to talk a little bit about some troubling passages of that. In the final week, we will be talking about uh, Scripture and human sexuality. Because if you weren't aware, our denomination is having that conversation right now. And both sides are quoting the Bible at each other. So we're going to talk a little bit about that in week six. So I'm actually doing a Facebook Live, which is, will be streamed on YouTube as well on Tuesday night, where we'll be talking a little bit more in detail about what's happening within why the Methodist Church is going through a split or a period of divisiveness related to the issue of human sexuality. I'll be talking about that a little bit more in detail to some of the you know, bigger ideas or concepts. I'm not going to be necessarily engaging in like a, a Bible back and forth dialogue necessarily because I want to do that on week six of this Bible one-on-one -on -one class. So my hope is that if we can understand the Old Testament, we can understand the New Testament, if we can understand what Scripture is to beginning, if we start to engage then in some of the troubling passages, we will then start to see how is it that we wrestle and live as faithful followers of Jesus in this time. Because I love the Bible, and it's transformed me because it tells me the story of the one who saved me. And so because... I love Jesus because I love the Bible so much. I want to study it. And when I study it, it doesn't lead me towards a narrowness of understanding. The text itself opens me to new possibilities. Did you ever notice that we tell the same story every Christmas? It's the same story. Jesus is born of a virgin. You know, we tell the same story every Easter. Every Good Friday and every Easter Sunday, Jesus dies and he's resurrected. It's the same story. But every year for us, it's different. You know why? Because we're different. And the Holy Spirit is doing something in you right now that as you engage in this thing called the Bible, you might have read this verse before, you might have read this chapter before, you might have read this letter or this book before, but you're going to start to see new things because this journey that we're on with this wonderful, inspired text will change us and transform us, okay? Uh, timeless truth. Truth in its time. All right, let's pray. God, thank you for this time of study, of community. We know we probably have more questions now at the end than we did coming in, but we trust that as we engage with this wonderful story of your redeeming love, that you're going to help us understand what it's like to be your follower, to be your disciple tonight. That's what we want. We want to follow you, Lord. So we thank you for the ways that you lead us. Send us out with grace and peace tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good. <clears throat> oh, the one thing I was thinking about, Tug, in answer to your question is whenever we see challenging things with Paul too, the interesting thing with that is read the Gospel of Luke. Because Luke was a travel companion of Paul. And Paul's letters were written before the Gospel of Luke. So there's a part of me that believes that Luke, I think, right, of course, under the inspiration of the Spirit, but also in the midst of his telling of the story of Jesus, is providing a counterbalance to the rigidity of Paul. Because I've said the gospel of Luke is a gospel of nobodies. 